Good afternoon from uh, the UK and welcome to our webinar and uh, Happy New Year from me. Um, I'm Becca Rowland, I'm a partner at Midas Aviation. I work very closely with OEG and it's always a pleasure to host these webinars for, um, for OEG. Um, we use the webinars to bring you some of the latest OEG data as well as some interesting data that we, we find from elsewhere in the industry um, and try and provide some insights from that. Um, I'm getting a bit of feedback actually. I don't normally get feedback. Somebody's phone on. Sorry. Um, so this month, um, what we've all been um, waiting for has finally happened. Um, to, to the surprise of many of us, I think, certainly in the timing, um, China announced its reopening from the 8th of January. Um, and so today we're, we're going to be focusing on what that means. We're going to be looking at whether the opening of China um, unlocks global travel. Is, is China the key is the question we're asking. Um, so most of the webinar will be looking at that, but we're also going to take a look at OEG's latest punctuality um, league. Through um, the last few years, we haven't really focused on the punctuality league. Um, On-time performance has been a bit all over the place, I think. And so um, anyway, it's, it's the punctuality league is back now, and we're also going to be looking at some of OEG's cancellation data. Um, it's obviously been quite a turbulent few weeks in terms of flight cancellations. Um, joining me today, we've got John Grant and Hannah Pearson and Ben Mutzbar. Um, so thank you all for, for coming along today. Um, let me start with, um, with you, Ben. You're new to our webinars. Thanks for joining us. And I know you know John reasonably well. Um, you're Senior Aviation Editor at The Points Guy. So uh, always coming to John, I think, for the latest news and data and um, a, a good word from John on uh, what's happening. Is that right? That's right. Uh, John, John's helped us out uh, in a pinch and for some deeper stuff um, over the years, um, both here at the Point Sky and my previous life at USA Today. So uh, we go way back. Great, great. Well, good to have you with us. And um, we've also got Hannah. Um, Hannah, thanks for joining us again. We normally bring you in on a morning webinar when we're focused a bit more on Asia Pacific. And this afternoon webinar, certainly afternoon if you're in the UK, is, is usually focused a bit more on Europe and the Americas. But I, I guess this news about China reopening is um, is is what everybody wants to hear about. And so it's uh, it's good to have you here to, to give your perspective on everything Chinese. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me again. Good, good. And John, as always, we've got John Grant, who's the chief analyst for OEG. Um, I think you were hoping for a quiet Christmas, weren't you? But then you probably had a lot of contacts from the press, didn't you, over cancellations and IT meltdowns and um, you've been busy. Yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, can I just say I wasn't I wasn't waiting for China to open. I was waiting for Brighton to beat Liverpool. Um, <laughs> at home and it took 60 years but it happened on saturday so the rest of the rest of 2023 can can just pass by as far as I can that's say. why you're, you're you're quite so optimistic at the moment isn't it that's why i'm optimistic but uh, yeah i mean you know there's always an aviation story isn't there um and uh, the gift that keeps on giving was the cyclone bomb and then some mud being slung at the airline industry by the us authorities and and then about five days later, an opportunity to throw some more mud from the airlines back at the FAA. So all good fun, uh, keeps us keeps us in the industry, keeps us happy, but lots to discuss today. Right, well, let's, um, let's move straight on to um, starting where we always do, a quick look at um, where we are with um, global capacity. Um, as I've said before, we always start looking at capacity um, because it, it uh, because the shed, we have scheduled data, we can get that sneak preview into uh, what's going to be happening over the next few months, as well as the history. Um, it's very timely data. So, um, John, what are we seeing here? Uh, well, um, we're seeing that we're edging ever closer to 2019's capacity points, um, and in some markets, you know, even halfway through last year, we busted through that sort of break point, um, places like Mexico, Colombia, Greece, uh, that we've talked about before were, were ahead of the curve and doing well. Um, this week sees the US um, actually ahead of 2019 capacity, which is which is um, super optimistic about the future. Uh, and most of the airlines there are reporting really good fourth quarter results as well. So um, if you look at global capacity on the left-hand side, don't, don't be too phased by that sudden drop in capacity in April. 
um, that that's driven by primarily Chinese airlines um, who have not um, fortunately um, finalized their schedules for the next uh, summer season and they'll probably be frantically looking at those and particularly international capacity which we'll touch upon uh, in the next couple of weeks before they are finalized so, so don't be too phased by that I think the dilemma still is Becca the international uh, proportion of the recovery um, that that needs to be filled uh, whereas in North America and Europe uh, it's generally quite good uh, in Southeast Asia um, you know we're still lagging with international capacity returning um, the news on the 8th of January is a really important part of uh, hopefully that optimism for 2023 I don't think any of us um, expected China to make such a bold statement um, and reopen and ease travel restrictions so quickly um, but it, with that comes its own set of challenges and, and issues that are now being faced by everyone. So um, we're on the road to recovery. Capacity is tight, uh, which is good. Yields are extremely high. Um, I mean, Ben in the US, US domestic fares are uh, just stellar uh, for the airlines, not for the travelers. Um, and when that's happening, of course, um, you know, that means more profitability, more opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, um, ben, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we cer certainly saw that uh, with with United's uh, earnings that were released yesterday. Uh, you know, I mean, say what you say what you will about economic headwinds, inflation, layoffs, all that. They uh, they're despite flying nine percent less, their their revenue was up. You know, double digits. So I just think that speaks to the resiliency, and and at least in the U.S. and North America market at this point. And I, 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 to echo Ben's point, when you think what the operating margins are on the generally in this industry, you know, we're talking about wafer thin margins, an industry that is looking at a return on investment of two percent. When you suddenly have nine percent less capacity and you have more revenue coming in at the same time. Um, that's a that's a perfect recipe to to create profitability, uh, and that's what we're seeing. And and Becca, we've spoken in the past about it. You know, capacity discipline through 2023 is going to be very important for airlines around the world to maintain those levels of profitability. Yeah, and I, I'm sure we'll get onto it, but it's we've we've talked before quite a bit about some of the um the, the resourcing constraints that there are at the moment you know, and supply chain issues and, and all of that in some ways for all the difficulty it it only um serves to to help that capacity discipline really um sort of a double edged sword really. Let's have a look at some of the individual countries across um Europe and um the Americas. Um, I'm, I apologise, we can't put every country in. There's always uh, somebody who asks a question at this point, what about, what about this particular country? Um, but I'm afraid we've picked the largest countries and um, if, you, if you want data on particular countries, um, then do approach OEG. Um, we've got the, as you said at the beginning, John, I think the USA has finally gone into a uh, sort of positive position relative to 2019, um, just this week. Mexico obviously has been um, been performing well throughout. And um, Spain and Turkey, we're, we're looking in the next couple of months to, to also see them uh, return to a position of recovery relative to 2019. Yeah, it's, it's generally, a, you know, a really positive picture in, in most markets. Um, and I think, I think the challenge is going to be people are going to expect this sort of level of recovery to continue through summer 23 and the reality is that it probably won't um, because there are so many factors at play uh, not least uh, aircraft availability spare parts uh, capacity constraints at airports resource constraints um, and you know financial officers and controllers making sure that any flight that operates is profitable so when if we get back and we get to 2019 capacity levels, I think that's the best we can probably expect uh, for this year. Um, and even then, I think that's been a little bit optimistic. I think we'll probably bounce along on a global basis at about 95, 96% of previous capacity. Um, and with that still strong pent up demand, and you know, people are still demand 
remains very strong depart despite all of the you know factors around recession inflation um, all of these factors it seems that travel is proving remarkably resilient this year um, and if that is the uh, UK tour operators reporting the busiest months uh, weekends of the year um, above previous levels you know there's a lot of pent-up demand that's still going to be activated and, and used and of course the strength of a dollar um, is just encouraging so many Americans uh, to visit Europe at the moment and that will continue through the summer as well. And, and what's the story with Germany here, this orange line at the bottom of our chart, um, really bucking the trend compared to other major European markets? Yeah, well, I, I think Germany will be like that until um, until it gets to penalties. When it gets to penalties, they always win, of course, in, in any competition. <laughs> um, but, but more seriously, this is, this is about, um, really, it's the underlying problem here is Lufthansa, who still haven't uh, returned to anywhere near their previous capacity. Uh, and that's a big big slug of the market. Um, there's more um, intermodal um, connectivity being undertaken, use of train, um, but it's it's generally a you know a depressed market because of Lufthansa and, and the lack of capacity. It's interesting they bought the A380 back. They said they never would, um, but but now that is coming back. But it's not going to be in service um, and on sale until around June of this month, uh, June of this year. So it's going to be behind the curve again. That is a consistent pattern with Lufthansa. They have been one of the slowest responders to the recovery, um, partly because of the complexity of the network, partly because of you know they have quite a large network to China. So that may help them, although the Russian overflight issue has got to be considered. There's lots of lots of things that just make it a, a, a softer market than others. And, and Ben, we've had a question in, and, and, and all of you listening, please do use the uh, the question feature to send in your questions, and we'll try and take them as we as we go. We've had a question in from Craig about, you know, can we expect to see these same trends in capacity reflected in um, the passenger demands, so the sort of traffic numbers that we're going to see, or is one lagging the other, or if capacity is constrained a bit, are we going to see higher loads? Uh, we know that fares were. Very, running very high the last uh, second half of last year. So wh where do you see um, that balance between capacity and traffic? I, I think we're, the balance is going to tilt towards capacity or, or I don't want to say lack thereof, but you know, a certainly limited uh, capacity. I think that, you know, if you look, especially, it's probably true in all markets, but I know in US it's, it's, it's been the, the real challenge for airlines for this entire century is really uh, not over, adding too much capacity when there is demand. And then of course you tank the whole, uh, all, all your margins. But right now, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, back, they, they've kind of had their hand forced between in the US, the pilot shortage, uh, aircraft that were, were parked, crews that were uh, on leave for a period of time. And, and you know you don't just flip a switch and bring them all back as you know. Um, so that's kind of forced their hands about not throwing too much capacity back into the system uh, too fast, too quickly. Um, I do think that's kind of uh, going to stay at least part of the equation for the rest of the year. Um, I think the bigger question is, is do we see demand stay as high as it is? And right now, all indications are yes. But, um, but like it feels like we've been saying for a year now, you've got inflation. You, uh, Microsoft announced 10,000 layoffs here in the U.S. Um, but none of these things have seemed to dent demand yet. Uh, all of these macroeconomic trends that you would think eventually will cool things off, have not done so yet. Um, so I think the airlines are gonna, partially through having learned over the years about capacity discipline, I think they'll keep some of that in check. Some of it will be forced upon them between not having enough um, regional pilots and uh, aircraft and delay, uh, delivery delays and, and parts, all those types of things. I think all of those things, at least for 2023, to me suggest it's gonna come together to keep things, uh, keep capacity in check. They'll certainly add it where they can. Um, but unless the demand curve changes from what we've seen over the during the recovery, um, I, I think this is we're going to see higher fares. I think we're going to see really really high loads. Um, I, I think for me, it's the it's the it's the demand side that would change that. For right now, I I see status quo, and uh, I would say at least in the fall, unless something really big happens in the spring or summer for the U.S. economy, and, and with Congress and the debt ceiling, I, it's entirely possible. So, you know, that's the wild card. I think yeah. it, what is fascinating is this demand, this strength of demand, 
is now acknowledges that there's probably 15 to 20 percent less corporate demand than there was three years ago and um, and that is missing and as we come you know as hopefully we come out of a recession will we see an upturn in corporate travel um and if so what would be the impact of that now many companies have managed to live without that corporate travel and and you know may be reluctant to to get on an airplane and spend the budget again but uh, i think it's been amazing how airlines have flipped and found a market that will sit in those business class seats and also how quickly they're moving um on premium economy products yep. so you know you look at emirates now they've they've now gone live with their premium economy product that will raise the bar for everyone else there isn't a carrier in the middle east who can cannot afford to have a, a premium economy product same on the atlantic it's going to be the same in asia um and i recall a, an airline cfo saying his premium economy passenger you know was was by a factor of seven the most profitable cabin he had on his airplane um so if they can fill those it's it's happy days and hannah can i bring you in at this point i know we're not really talking about china and asia but my sure. understanding is for all the tensions in the Chinese market moment, you know, they've got some of the same issues, the economy faltering a bit, certainly compared to where it was. Um, but many people have saved a lot of money over the last few years. Um, and, and certainly that was the case here um, in the UK. Some people who were no longer commuting and didn't have that expense or um, all sorts of reasons actually had a bit more money in their purse. And, um, and that may still be the case. Is that is that the case in China? Is the economy going, there's an economic issues going to make it a little bit more challenging for travel or is there just a lot of people who want to use that saved money to, to travel? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there is um, an economy slowdown. You know, they, they released their Q4 GDP growth numbers um, just yesterday, I think, and it was something like one of the worst growth rates they've had in nearly 50 years. Retail spend is quite weak, um, but it's a large market. Um, and in reality, you know, that's going to perhaps impact that lower um, income level of people. And there's still that huge middle class that can afford to spend. And, and like you said, there have been saving up, not even being able to really travel domestically, even in China with all of these different lockdowns and snap lockdowns being on, people have been quite reluctant to go out. Um, so yeah, I, I think there really is the potential, as they call it, for revenge travel. Um, and, and, and people are going to be going out when they can, when capacity is yeah. added back, as we'll I talk later. We're still seeing some of that here. Okay, that's all really interesting. Let's, um, let's move on though, and look at cancellations. John, what has been happening, and can we can we just blame the weather for all of this? Well, no, you can blame the weather as the starting point, but then you have to look, dig a bit deeper and find out well, why did it? Why did what happened happen, and why did some airlines prove to be more resilient than others? Do you want to talk us through what has actually happened? I'm sure most people will know, but maybe yeah, not well, um, there was there was. Um, um, I mean, Ben, you probably experienced it. The, the mammoth cyclone bomb that, that hit uh, the US and basically wiped out nearly every airline, I think, for about four or five days. Um, but, but the important thing, of course, when these things happen is, you know, there is a phrase about something happens and you deal with it. Um, and I won't use that word. Uh, but there are some airlines who dealt with it very well or relatively well. And there are some that that quite frankly got caught sleeping or off guard. Um, and when you dig deeper, um, you know, it, it's very clear that some did not have the infrastructure, resources, technology, systems, processes, or even enough mobile phones uh, on their employees to make the calls to find out where they were. Um, so if you look at uh, these uh, table on the left-hand side, these are um, the last seven, two, four, six, seven weeks um, of operation and the levels of cancellation by the US majors, so American, Alaska, JetBlue, Delta, Spirit, United, and Southwest. Um, and Becca, I know you highlighted all of those that are sort of more than a 5% cancellation. More than 5%, cancellation. I think, yeah, over, over the course of a week. And you can see for, from, from the 19th of December through to the 1st of January, so essentially two weeks, um, more, than more than one in five flights operated or scheduled to be operated by uh, Southwest was cancelled uh, and on some days um, it was total wipeout 
you know, the whole network collapsed and, and very few flights. That 39% there is an average of the seven days. And there were a couple of days when it was up at sort of 70 and 80% mm. of flights being cancelled. Um, and it's, it, it's an extremely frustrating time for the travellers, of course, you know, peak holiday demand, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then you can see on the right hand side, um, President Biden, who um, wasn't taking a nap at that moment in time, um, you know, commented that we're, we're going to get this sorted and, and it's all going to be um, evaluated. Maybe we've put some processes, some legislation in place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it would be fair to say there are no there are no legal requirements. There is no consumer per, uh, protection per se in the US. Uh, and when you compare that to the European Union, where we have uh, 264 and we have delay compensation, um, it's, you know, you're left at the mercy of the airline. And as you work your way across these airlines, some are very good at customer care or relatively good. And some just lost the plot. Uh, ben, I mean, you, you experienced this more than me. How was it living with this? Well, you know, I think here you just accept that that's a fact of the, you know, it's the way of life if you're flying in the U.S. Um, that really uh, you're not, if your flight's ever canceled you're, or delayed, you're significantly delayed, you're never entitled to more than a refund of your trip if you choose to abandon the rest of your trip. Um, in fact, for some of us here in the U.S., going to Europe and having a flight delay is like, I don't know, it's like an early Christmas present with your, uh, you know, 800 or 1,000 euro compensation that you get for your three-hour delay that in the U.S. would mean you just have a bigger bar tab while you wait out the delay. So, <laughs> um, so you know, so that 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 is a real big difference. And and obviously, if if the U.S. did have European-style protections for flight delays and cancellations, good golly, this would have been a really expensive storm for the U.S. carriers. Uh, yeah. And it already is, to be clear. I mean, you saw you've already seen the the hit to Southwest bottom line, which is approaching nine hundred million dollars based on some of the estimates we've seen um, from the analysts and from the airline itself. So it was, in fact, expensive. Um, now, Southwest did go above and beyond in offering compensation for hotels and, and alternate bookings and, and food and those types of things. But it's precisely, I think, because I mean, they they may have done some of that. I, I know they would have done some of that. They would have not done all of that if it were not for things like that tweet you see there from President Biden and the, the renewed consumer focus and stepped up pressure from the current administration via the DOT. Um, previously, it would have been just up to the airlines at their sole discretion, and you probably wouldn't have heard a peep or not much of a peep from DOT under previous administrations. This one has taken much more, I don't know if activist role is quite the right way to say it, but they really um, you know, put the mantle of consumer protection kind of front and center as they try to leave a legacy, presumably, after this administration. So you did see some increased pressure, and I have no doubt that that led Southwest in particular to reimburse more things than it would have ordinarily. Um, that said, though, I mean, gosh, and looking at your data here, look at that. It's, you know, the, the week of December 19th through 25th for the U.S. is bad, but, but what stands out to me is that week of December 26th. Look, you see all of the other carriers, you know, spirit stays a little high, but you see all the other carriers kind of revert back to at least a normal range of, of cancellations. But Southwest not only did not do that, they went up. And that underscores all the, the problems that you talked about as we came into this part. Um, what I think that really says there is just how bad this was for Southwest. And I, I think this for them, um, I don't know how much any, if you remember, or how much any, that I'm sure a lot of the people on this webinar do, you know, it reminds me of the uh, JetBlue Valentine's Day storm mm -hmm. of, oh gosh, and I should know the year off the top of my head, but 2008, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that one, and I'm not necessarily saying it's going to happen for this one, but if you remember that that episode where JetBlue miscalculated uh, the the storm's effect and operated too close to the to the brink and had all those planes get stuck on the on the apron. That not only created a crisis for the airline and its reputation and led to the ouster of its CEO founder, uh, it also spurred. It was one of the few things that actually mobilized the DOT to to enact consumer protection for the long tarmac delays, uh, the rule that we have here in the U.S. Um, I don't know that the Southwest story uh, situation will create any similar protections, but this is certainly an epic meltdown, airline specific meltdown that will go down probably, and if not the century's biggest airline 
gaffes, uh, at least in the last 50 years, where you have such a singular, you know, like you have United in 2000, you have uh, JetBlue in 2008 with Valentine's Day. It's up there with with some of the biggest single airline uh, meltdowns that you'll see. And whether it spurs new protections or not, I'm a little skeptical about, but it's certainly going to, or at least should reshape Southwest and finally give them the kick that they need to upgrade their infrastructure. And I think we will see some changes come out of that. They've even talked about how they might change some of their, uh, not necessarily their their point to point scheduling, but maybe how they flow crews over that. I mean, it's, it's just going to lead to, you know, I, I think we're going to see some differences in that. I don't know how passenger facing they are, but Southwest can't have this happen again. I think they have so much goodwill that they can get through this one, but they can't have another one. And they're not the only ones to have had uh, technical glitches, are they? No, all the all the U.S. airlines in, in the recent I, I was thinking more about the FAA had its own little glitch. Didn't it? <laughs> yes, right. How, how quickly we see how quickly we forget. No, that's right. And I think in the U.S., this is one of the more interesting nuances to what's happened here over the holiday window. Is you had the big airline meltdown that was prompted by a legitimately bad winter storm, and of course, it was Southwest's inability to recover quickly that became the headline from that. But then you had the FAA with its own creaky infrastructure have its own issue when it's uh, um, notice air emissions uh, alerts go out uh, to get into the weeds there a little bit, but that's a, considered a safety critical uh, system. So when that went down, they decided to issue a nationwide ground stop, which it was in effect for about two hours, give or take. Uh, but to put that in perspective, that's a 9-11 type of ground stop where you call it the entire nation's flights. And so it didn't last all that long, but it was a headache. And now, you know, there's already been this simmering uh discontent between the airlines and faa obviously or uh, dot obviously you have dot pointing the finger at the airlines for consumer protections and why can't they run a better operation and recovery and all of that uh and the and dot certainly took to their soapbox to its soapbox during the southwest meltdown but look the airlines are really frustrated with dot too they don't say it publicly for risk of escalating that feud in public and having a, having Congress involved and all that, but you've got air traffic control delay issues in Florida that routinely snarl the entire U.S. system on a bad day. Uh, you've got you've had staffing issues that certainly have been exacerbated by COVID. Um, but now you kind of have an open display infrastructure problems at both the airlines and at the FAA. Um, I'm a little more confident the airlines will get theirs sorted out than the FAA. But um, yeah, it's it's been a real mess of a of a holiday season here in the U.S. on that front. I, think, I, I recall pre-Christmas, pre the FAA actually advised or said to airlines that they couldn't accommodate any more new air services to Florida. I mean, that that is just, from an airline perspective, you you know, you just won't say anything publicly, but that that just says how how creaky the system had yeah. become. Yeah, and you know we've seen these issues in you know in various places. We've had issues at Newark with capacity, as that especially United is frustrated about, and they their hands are kind of tied with how much they can say as they want regulators to to view them favorably for the equivalent of slots there, that type of thing. But um, that's less well, you know, the New York airspace is also infrastructure and how what the capacity is. But Florida has been the real fly in the ointment uh, in the recent you know pandemic era, anyway. Um, and and yeah, to tell airlines that they can't that they have to to make them even consider how much capacity they're going to add to the one US market that's a bottomless pit of demand, <laughs> that's not good from the airline's perspective. And certainly, um, you know, the airlines are gonna to lobby to their full power to get some upgrades there. But we've been talking about next gen in, in the US for, well, gosh, it's not a century, but it feels like it. And I don't know what's ever gonna change on that. I know they keep saying it will, but here we all are still talking about it 25 years in. So I don't know, I'm not optimistic. And, and John, the Luft, we've talked a lot about the US, the Lufthansa numbers, what happened there over, over the Christmas period? Uh, combination of knock-on delays, I think. I mean, you know, I know they obviously lost some aircraft in, in the US in, in the cyclone bomb like everyone else. Um, but beyond that, I'm not, I'm not that clear, Becca, we'd need to dig a bit deeper. Uh, yeah. interesting, that both, interesting that both Lufthansa and BA, um, you know, who are network carriers with hub operations, it could well be a weather related event when you look at that. We had snow, Germany had snow in the uh, first yeah, week of December, yeah. didn't it? Second week of December. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's um, stay with some of these issues that the airlines are facing, particularly in the US. Um, 
pilots. I think, Ben, you, you talked about pilots earlier, and we know this isn't just a, a US issue. There are issues uh, with pilot um, scarcity um, in all sorts of parts of the world. But Delta's just come to an agreement, hasn't it, with it's going to pay its pilots 30% more over the next few years. Uh, how, do, how does the industry feel about a 30% pay, pay rise? Well, I'm sure any industry, if you're sitting in the uh, CFO seat, you don't like to see that. <laughs> but yeah. um, but you probably, if you're the you know the operations, if you're the COO, you do probably at least appreciate the stability it brings to your to your pipeline and to your um, labor infrastructure to be able to have some predictability and reliability to um, attrition and turnover and, and putting people in the pipeline. So um, no airline is going to be happy to see its labor costs go up that much, but it's just a market reality at this point. And, and you look at the lab, uh, you look at the regional airlines in the U.S. Some of those pay rates, um, whether a mix of temporary or, or permanent, what they've had to do to retain and bring people into the system is just that some of those pay increases have been astounding. So, I mean, yeah, the short answer is no, no airline, no, no management in any industry would be happy to see such a short term and fast spike in salaries. It's obviously an ex a new expense that probably would have been hard to predict. And well, gosh, not just 2019, but probably 2020, 2021. But that's what they needed to do to, to kind of stabilize the uh, the picture with with uh, pilot staffing. So um, it will be awfully hard for them to claw that back going forward, given the nature of, of contracts and, and union negotiations. Uh, so that's probably here to stay. And at some point, uh, that that cost will be passed on through to passengers, whether it's probably through a mix of higher fares, more ancillaries. Uh, whatever levers the airlines have at their disposal to, to try to kind of offset that. that. I, now, the, I think, the other wild card I mean, is if fuel goes down, maybe it just evens out, but the airlines will certainly want to call back what they can. They will. I think they will. it's I really think interesting. It's We're talking here about mandatory retirements. So that's, you know, you've got to retire, not about voluntary retirement. When people get to two or three years before retirement and think, you know what, I can't be bothered to do those last couple of years. It's not worth it. <laughs> And if you look at uh, that's probably how we both feel, Becker, isn't it? Um, but if you if you look at if you look at American Airlines, that they are exposed to a, a factor of twice twice as much exposure in 23 and 24 than their United and Delta and their legacy peers. Um, so they've got a big recruitment job to do, and the mark has been set by Delta, who's already put 18% on this issues, and will put more on next year. Yeah, and I mean it's it's zero sum game for the airlines, right? You can't have a new contract that doesn't match your competitor, or at least the unions are certainly not going to do their best to keep that from happening. So I, you know, we're certainly in a cycle of of escalation, or or likely to be in a cycle of es escalation for for labor costs here. Okay, um, Joel, I'd like to have you talk a little bit to um, OEG's punctuality league results. We these were published, I think, just a, a week or two ago. Um, we've just got the one slide here with with the headline numbers. They are available on OEG's website if uh, if you're looking for more detail. Um, have we gone back to where we were before the pandemic? Are the same winners and losers? Um, Not quite. Um, there was there was a noticeable trend through the year of improvement, but you know the summer was a mess, quite frankly, for everyone. And however hard airlines have tried, um, you know, on time performance was was damaged. Um, so we need to we need to put that in um, perspective. Uh, but I I think there are some there are some traditional carriers at the top of these list. You know, we have Delta. Uh, who always perform very well, um, and in Europe it's been Eurowings, uh, low-cost carrier, part of the Lufthansa group. Copa uh, have again performed really well. Safair, who uh, when we've looked at the Middle East and Africa in recent years has has been a very strong performer on on-time performance. Um, the results are are pretty consistent with what we've seen in pre in previous years. It's a, a, a sort of a regular couple of percentage points down in most carriers. The one that is noticeably different, I think, is United Airlines. Um, and, and maybe that plays to, you know, part of this profitability that they've seen in the fourth quarter, the fact that they're in on-time performance is one of the few carriers in the world who've improved. Um, it's getting closer to uh, Delta and Alaska. 
Um, and there is there's there is a correlation, I think, between you know consumer demand, uh, product uh, awareness, and on-time performance. So I think um, I think that's an interesting um, standout for me this year. Do, do you think that they? I mean, we know Delta's done quite well for a while, and and you know we when we first used to comment on on this, which is a good few years ago now. You know, we've always always impressed with Delta because they're such a big airline and yet still had such good on-time performance. Are they the sort of the, the bar by which um, United is trying to, you know, benchmark their performance? I, from an external perspective, I think so. I mean, from your perspective, Ben, in the market, is is that where United aspire to get to? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they'd like to be better than all of their of their your mainline peers. Um, but yeah, Delta has been the standard bearer, I think, for, oh, for the better part of, oh, probably a decade at this point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I what I think is so, you're, I think all of your observations are right about about United. And I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is, you know, they've been fiddling with their um, arrival banks, trying to like right size the number of banks they have to facilitate connections without breaking the schedule. They also have the um, connection saver tool from a consumer passenger where they'll hold a flight at the gate for a period of time if they know there are half a dozen, a dozen passengers who are gonna miss the connection if the flight takes off on time. So not only is it on time, but they've also been doing what they can to to keep people from misconnecting when it's gonna be, a you know, when they'll be unable to be accommodated if they miss the connection. I think these are all really interesting things that United has done and, and certainly, you know, any airline that aspires to have business traffic and to have reliable traffic that's not purely leisure, uh, a reliable, you know, a good schedule is one thing, but a reliable schedule is probably even more important um, mm -hmm. to know that you're going to get where you want to go when they told you you were going to get there. So I think that is, is it's, I know it's something that the airline has focused on and you see tangible results. Um, to put it in a big multi-year perspective, um, however, it's gotten skewed by the prism of the pandemic. I think it is so interesting when you went back to the wave of mergers here in the U.S. Uh, a decade ago and you had American U.S. Airways, you had you know, Delta Northwest, you had, um, you know, United Continental. When, when, when all of that was starting to shake out, um, I think the conventional wisdom, at least for my opinion was, is, you know, Delta was clearly had emerged from that um, shakeout as the best performing carrier with the most premium product that everyone was trying to, to reach, to your point, to your question from earlier. And I think we all assumed that American and US Airways was gonna be the new American, was gonna be in a race to catch Delta. And United was a mess at that point, and look where we are now. So it's that that has not turned out at all the way, at least that I thought it would go. And I know many of my other peers in the in the industry observer space uh, also probably predicted American was the more likely challenger to Delta, not United. But now it is United, and I think it's exactly by focusing on things like this reliability, uh, keeping passengers from missing connections. I know you're going to hear if you if you're on the consumer side, you always hear from a passenger for any airline that says, "I flew to." Salt Lake City and this airline misconnected me and I'm never flying them again, but they will the next time there's a $49 fare. Um, but yeah, no, I, I just think it's interesting. United has certainly done a lot of things right. They've pushed a lot of the right levers uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, they certainly, in my opinion, are the airline that's that's best poised to keep rising to Delta's level over the, the next, say, two year period. Really interesting. Let's have a look at China. We promised you we would talk about China um, and see what is happening there. So um, to everyone's surprise, really, on the 8th of January, um, China reopened. Um, in response, a whole range of countries put um, some sort of measure in place, um, some sort of travel restriction or, or, or mostly just needing PCR tests, which actually isn't a big deal for the Chinese, as, as far as we understand. It's that they are the most tested nation on the planet, are they, Hannah? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, or just for their daily life, they, they, they were having to be tested daily in some in some places just to be able to you know go out and take public transport so really i i don't see these, this testing being as such a barrier um even for things like getting that pcr test within china itself i mean mostly testing is still free right now so you don't even have that that mm. barrier um to consider so I think so the initial, has been made the initial response it, you know. that was was like oh there's all these sort of reactions from countries but really they're yeah. quite 
lukewarm, aren't they? And and what's noticeable, yeah. I think, is some of the countries that haven't put restrictions or haven't imposed anything. We've got no Thailand on the list here, no Vietnam, no <laughs> Indonesia. And Thailand was going to, and then the day it was supposed to start, they they rescinded that, didn't they? I think just pressure from the tourism yeah. bodies who said, you can't do this. We need those Chinese yeah. tourists. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think Thailand woke up to the fact because they were going to impose a uh, a fully vaccinated requirement on all travelers, not just Chinese travelers. And I think then they suddenly realized, oh, a lot of our source market right now is coming from Europe and not all of those are fully vaccinated. Uh, quick, quick, guys, let's let's backtrack. And there's a, kind of a typical Thailand reaction we keep seeing um, again and again. I don't know why they don't learn, but <laughs> there we are. So we That's would think... International capacity. Sorry, John? In international capacity in Thailand. Yeah, international capacity in Thailand is still just above 50% of pre-pandemic levels. That 50% is nearly all China. You know, there's a bit in Southeast Asia and there's a bit in Europe, but a lot of it is is China. They just couldn't afford it. And to your point about, you know, these are notional gestures. In the UK, apparently, whilst you have to take PCR test, if it confirms you um, are infected and you have COVID, there's no quarantine requirement. You can still go into Marks and Spencers and buy a sandwich. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so I guess our expectation had been, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, that there would be a surge of, of, of air travel happening as a result. But when we look at the, the capacity um, that's, that's in the market now, and the dotted line that you can see on each of these charts is, is going forward, we haven't really seen um, a surge in capacity. There's, as, as the title of this slide says, no rush. And, and actually, when we think that through, that's quite logical, isn't it, John? Yeah, it, um, you know, it's really fascinating is because the whole question on the seventh, on the first of January in, in you know, the travel space was, surely China's got to open at some point in 2023. Will it be third quarter? Will it be fourth quarter? No one expected, um, such a such a dramatic change in travel restrictions on the 8th of January. Um, but the question now is, well, how on earth is that going to shape out? And I, I keep casting my mind back to the Airline Association of Australia, who in the depths of the pandemic wrote to the Australian government and said, if you're thinking of reopening Australia to international travel, we will need six months to get ready. We will need to recruit staff back into the operation. We will need to load schedules into the systems. We will need to take bookings. Tour operators will need to get space um, on aircraft and in hotels. And we're going to see exactly the same situation from China. It is going to be a slow burn. And there's an added complexity, of course, in that you know um, geopolitical events such as uh, access to Russian airspace um, is going to be a challenge for European carriers. Um, there's pre-committed capacity for this summer and, and that goes through to the end of October. You know, the US airlines have placed a lot more capacity into Europe this forthcoming summer. New destinations being added, new city pairs, increased frequencies, all of these things, all of which have got bookings on them and, you know, high yield bookings. So why would you want to turn away that business um, for the, the opportunity to reignite your Chinese market where the yields will probably be lower. Um, there's all sorts of operational issues. You know, you're not going to be able to operate the same slot patterns you previously operated. Um, it's, it's, it's full of challenges for the long haul carriers. For those within perhaps a three, four hour flying range of China, it's a much easier story. You know, it's a much faster return. That's why we're seeing it, uh, capacity um, and interest in places like Thailand and in Indonesia. It's, it's, it's vital for their economies and for their tourism sectors to get back into the market. It isn't for North American airlines and it isn't as crucial for European carriers. Now, well, John's talked quite a lot about the, the airline response. Hannah, what about the Chinese travellers themselves? What are the, the obstacles for them to travel now? I, you know, there's a lot to be said yeah. about passports, about visas, about yeah. immigration services, just the practicalities of, of somebody who wants to travel being able to go somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it's, you know, similar to, to what we saw in Southeast Asia when Southeast Asia reopened last year as well. You know, suddenly 
passports that haven't been issued, people have realized, oh, I, I need to go and renew my passport. Um, in China right now, you've got spring festival, so everybody's going to take a nice long holiday. If they're not on spring festival, they might be down with COVID. So your manpower actually handling those passport applications is going to be lower. And then, Becca, like you say, for they, a they lot of countries... Have, China hasn't issued passports in three years, have they? So there are a lot that need to be renewed. Backlog. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then the whole visa issue, Ch most countries Chinese travelers go to, they need to apply for visas. And again, if I if I look at Southeast Asia as that example, um, towards the end of last year, for people like Thai, Thais to travel to the US, they had to wait something like four or five months to be able to get a slot at the US yeah. embassy to be able to get that visa. Get that um, and you can imagine that can for imagine. China, the, the volume is going to be even greater. Um, and I actually was checking out earlier um, the U.S. embassy kind of waiting times. And some of the U.S. embassies, the US um, embassies are still not um, open still for visa open processing, processing in countries in countries like Chengdu. Like and yeah. um, the Chinese appetite, though, to travel hasn't changed, has it? That, you know, we used to talk about this sort of um, technological ecosystem that many Chinese people live in, where they're always looking for travel and they, they travel you know, and they share their, you know, their ideas about you know, their work to tens and that's carried on, as I understand it, throughout the past three years. There's no loss of appetite to travel, is there? Yeah, absolutely. I think the whole um, time throughout the pandemic, you know, the Chinese travellers haven't been able to go anywhere, so they've been instead engaging with um, online content, planning where they want to go, I don't know if that buzzing noise is uh, is on my end. I'm planning where they want to go and, and dreaming about that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so they've been planning this whole time. So they 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 still really want to go. And you know, even that example of uh, lots of live streaming that's been happening for for travel sites throughout the pandemic as well. And you know, people have been putting down money for packages, even though. They're not able to to travel at that time. There is that appetite. They really want to travel out, but we've got to get through all of this high airfares, limited capacity. Get your passport renewed. Get the visa, and finally, you can go. And I mean, you've got that psychological aspect. For the last three years, Chinese people have been told it's really dangerous to leave the country. Don't leave the country. And suddenly, the government turns around and says, "Okay, guys, you can go out now." Um, that's going to take some adjustment, I think. Yeah, though I was speaking to somebody um, in China a, a week or two ago, and she said, oh, everybody I know has had COVID now, we're, we're fine to go anywhere. Um, there was a sort of a, a certain, you know, I don't mind about COVID at all now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go, so interesting. Uh, we've got a map here of um, all these purple dots are places uh, in the world, airports where there used to be international, in, in 2029, there was, uh, 2019, there were international air services from China to these places. Uh, mostly they had air services by both a Chinese carrier and a foreign carrier, but there were a handful that had just a, a service by, by either only Chinese carriers or only the foreign carriers. Um, John, you've already spoken a bit about the, the, the slowness it's going to it's going to take for air services to come back to Europe and I, I think you, you and I agreed that perhaps we're just going to see really air services to some of the hub airports in Europe you know there was a lot of tier two airports that had services and they're, they're going to take a while to come back. Ben how do you see the situation in the states so the is it it's going to be a bit lukewarm is it and for sort of re-establishing these air services I know there's some um, now but, but the capacity is quite low. Ben, can you hear me? Oh, we've lost Ben. <laughs> Just temporarily. I think he was having problems with the sound. Ben, I think it, it, will, it will be. There's, there's no urgency for the US airlines to come back into this market at all. You know, I, I think the stance um, of both the US and European air, airlines uh, is, of course, China's a big market. If we can serve it and the conditions are right, then we, we will operate there. But all of the big three Chinese airlines are part of, or two of the big three airlines are part of major alliances. And, you know, there's lots of speculation that China Southern is going to join One World. Um, and they will feed their respective alliance partners, be it in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, wherever it happens to be. And the European carriers will sit back and say, thank you very much, I'll carry them on a European sector. Um, or maybe I'll carry them on a mid-range sector to somewhere else. 
Um, but I, I don't think I don't think there is an urgency or, or any pressure um, from the European airlines. Um, and indeed, I've just I've just read that the U.S. carriers are looking for a slot waiver uh, in China this summer because it's too late for them to get back in the market, um, and they don't want to lose the slots they've got. Um, that's okay for them. For the European carriers, when you think about this, you know, closure of Russian airspace means, on average, two hours additional flying in each direction on any sector from Europe to China. That probably means the historic slots they've had are no longer going to work, so they've got to find new slots. Um, for some reason, although the airports never look very busy, it always seems difficult for European airlines to get the slots they need at Chinese airports, um, and I've always wondered why. Um, I'm sure some people have some thoughts as to why that could be. But um, it's not going to be easy for these airlines to come back and operate their previous schedules, uh, and particularly the connecting flows that they need to make those services profitable. And there is, you know, the cargo market's depressed. It's not as strong as it was three years ago when everyone was saying we need cargo flights to China. Um, so on that basis, you know, that's that's another challenge that we have. So, so if we, you know, we accept there's a slowness for Europe and, and North America, and that you know the first markets to come back are going to be within Asia, obviously. Two two questions really for you, Hannah. One is how oh. do the different destinations differentiate themselves one from another? Um, and, and are we going to see new destinations emerge? I know there's been, um, we're, we're quite interested in um, in some of the Middle East states and, and places like Saudi Arabia, who I think have, have got quite a liberal visa regime now for Chinese people. Are we going to see some of these um, new um, destinations emerge in, in, a, in a way that perhaps is a bit unexpected? And there's always people who want to go somewhere new and do something different. What, what can you add on those topics? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to which destinations have been consistently engaging with, um, I think maybe Ben's back. <laughs> Apologies, everyone, for the tech issues. Good to have you back, Ben. Briefly. <laughs> 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 So I think we're going to see um, those destinations who have been constantly engaging with Chinese travellers um, throughout the pandemic benefiting from that. And other ones are going to be playing catch up. So I was just reading earlier that destinations like Visit Britain pretty much paused their marketing efforts in the Chinese market over these past few years, whereas destinations like Switzerland, like Germany, have actually been very active and they're, you know, in all of the right platforms that they should be to target those Chinese travelers. So I think it's really going to be those ones who were smart and kept going with it that are going to benefit. Um, and like you say, I think there might be some unexpected destinations. I mean, not aviation, but Laos with its high-speed railway between China to Laos. Um, that's going to generate some serious interest, I think, when they actually reopen that land border they haven't done yet. So, um, but in theory, you could travel from Kunming um, to Vientiane. Um, that could then potentially carry on um, and have an overspill effect to Thailand um, with that kind of overland route as opposed to flying from southern China. So I think we are going to see some kind of interesting travel patterns uh, emerging definitely um, this year. And how long was that border crossing open for? Is it, it, it didn't open very long, did it, before the pandemic? Or has it been open at all, that, um, that rail route? No, the, well, the railway only opened last uh, last November or last well, December 21 or yeah. November. So it's, it's really just been about a year in operation. So it's it's been open, but you can't cross you over. Can't so cross. the Chinese portion has been open. The Laos part has been open. And in Laos, it's very popular again. Um, yeah. And so I think they're really hoping they're going to get this overspill. Of, of Chinese tourists, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but again, they have issues. They, they, it's uh, difficult booking systems and, and everything else, so they've, they've got to get that ironed out. But Thailand is so, definitely eyeing that up, that flow. So your advice would be, I'm, I'm thinking about your comment about Visit Britain earlier, that mm. really um, destination marketing bodies really need to be um, engaging with the Chinese market very seriously now if they haven't yeah. done it for a while. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and what are yeah. Chinese travelers um, looking for? 
I mean, I, I think it's interesting. I, you know, there's, there's always that preconception, I think, of Chinese travelers arriving in big tour buses and just wanting to go shop and wanting to go, you know, tick off all of the main sites off their list. And I think there is still that segment, but that's now changed. You know, that that's perhaps the people who are traveling overseas for the first time from third tier cities. If you're talking about people traveling from Beijing, from Shanghai, they're, you know, traveling as FIT. They have had, you know, over the last few years during the pandemic, lots of different niches have appeared. Um, I was talking to someone from China earlier this morning and then they were saying camping is this whole new thing domestically that Chinese travelers are now doing. And before that was never an interest. And I, I think it's camping light. Um, but there are all of these niches, all of these new interests that are arising, um, have arisen during the pandemic. And um, it's almost kind of re-examining those assumptions that people have about Chinese travelers. And I think that's where that comment about destinations who have been tracking that, who have been in the Chinese market the last few years will be ahead because they would have seen this um, and they've been playing on this, whereas people who are coming in fresh are going to have to catch up on all of that and chuck out everything out the window that they thought they knew, basically. And, and it sounds like some of those trends are actually quite similar to what we've seen in other markets, a desire perhaps to for more outdoor travel, for more remote places, for experiences over shopping. Um, th th those are, are trends we've seen in many markets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I think there's always this, this conception that Chinese travelers are pretty shallow, but I think that's, it's outdated now. You know, they're, they're a lot more sophisticated than that, and particularly technology-wise. Um, that, that's going to be one of the big things because they are just miles ahead of mobile adoption and everything else for travel booking. Yeah, very interesting. Welcome back, um, Ben. <laughs> Apologies to all for speaking of technologically ad advanced uh, users. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apologies for the glitch on my end. That's okay. That's okay. We, we've uh, we've got away with very few um, glitches over the years, so um, we're probably due one. Okay, we're going to move away from China just for, we've got one more slide to show you. We, we've probably got time for one or two questions as well. Um, we wanted to look at um, some of the data that OAG has, um, some of its traffic data does allow us to look at forward bookings, um, but it's just a snapshot of the data. Um, so we tend to look at it as the change in bookings from one period to another rather than the absolute numbers. So what I've shown here is um, bookings in the system between uh, for travel between February and August and how they were in November versus what we're seeing now and that percentage increase. And I've split it out on the transatlantic by US point of sale and UK point of sale. And I guess this is what we would expect to see, isn't it, John, that the, the US point of sale is just growing much faster. And that's to do with exchange rates, isn't it? It's just that it's it's attractive to come to the UK at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's a major part of it. I also think, you know, most of the capacity that's being added on the transatlantic is being added by US majors. Um, so there'll be there'll be a degree of frequent flyer burn as well that's probably taking place in the summer months if, if you move quickly enough and you get a booking. Um, but, it, but this also points to exactly why these carriers are taking a long game approach on returning to China because you know the bookings are strong. Um, you wouldn't expect to see you know a, a great uptick in bookings for for August, but nonetheless, you know they they are growing uh, and will continue to grow. So it's it's no surprise. I mean, US point of sale activity for bookings in February. Um, on that basis, you know, London is London's hotels are going to be full of US uh, travellers by the looks of it, um, which is which is great, and um, you know that's the type of recovery we want we want to see. Uh, it's it's an amazingly strong market, and as we said right at the beginning, you know, we should we shouldn't underestimate the opportunities for um, a successful 2023 for the airline industry. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, let's just take um, one or two questions. We we had a question um, going back to what we were talking about was happening in the states and the, the lack of consumer protection there. Um, the question was about whether the EU Commission might weaken traveller protection. I I personally can't see that happening. But 
might we see changes in the states? Do you think? You, I think Ben, when we spoke earlier, you you didn't think there was really any appetite to change the rules around consumer protection. Um, certainly not to weaken them. Um, I think there there may be, uh, you know, there there have been some new. The, the DOT has rattled its its um has rattled the cages that the airlines should be more consumer friendly and institute some more protections and and should. Clear, more clearly delineate what passengers are entitled to, which again, as we started off with, is not much. Um, so I think if it's going to go one way or the other, there there is some appetite perhaps to to add some protections, but we're not going to see anything like what we have in Europe or uh, or the UK as far as those types of customer protections. But um, I I personally expect um, status quo. But under the current administration, uh, I don't think we will see any any weakening of protections. Uh, if there is a second Biden administration or a second, a next Democratic administration, they may, especially if it's a lame duck uh, uh, administration, they may feel emboldened to try to push some things through. Um, so we'll see if that happens. But I, I mostly expect the status quo. But I do think that the sword that the U.S. DOT might use to make the prod airlines to be a little more consumer friendly is fines for running afoul of existing um, regulations for delays that exceed maximums, tarmac delays in particular, or for slow refunds, or things that are that are typically already included in, in DOT guidelines. Uh, I think we might see more frequent enforcement and more liberal interpretation of what merits enforcement actions. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And John, what about in Europe? Is there, are you getting any, there's no, no sense of changes there? I, the airlines would love to see a reduction in the uh, compensation levels. Um, I, I don't really think the European Union's got any desire or appetite to uh, dilute um, the benefits or the uh, compensation that's paid out. They are uh, more fascinated with things like uh, sustainability and emissions and things like that. It's, it's not it's not a vote winner at the moment, is it? No, no. Okay, well, we've just run past the uh, the four o'clock. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you, Ben, Hannah, and John, for all your contributions. Really interesting discussion. Um, we will be back uh, next month on uh, Wednesday, the 15th of February, and we're going to be looking at connectivity in that discussion. So um, watch this space. Do um, sign up. Uh, to OEG's blog, which is written every week by John, if, um, if you don't already get that. And there's plenty of information on the OEG website, um, just tracking what's happening in the industry. So uh, please do head over and have a look at that if you haven't done already. So thanks very much, everyone, and we'll see you again in a month. Bye then. Thanks very much. Bye.